So, I said we're starting a series uh, this morning on the problem of pain and suffering and how Christians meet that challenge of pain and suffering. And you may have seen a few posters up around the town, have you? Thanks. Okay. Thanks for the encouragement, guys. There are posters up uh, in various places. We're really limited now where we can put posters. And so I think there's one in the garage, and there's one under the arches in the town, and there's one, you know. But if you see places we can put small posters on the A5, um, let me know, we'll, we'll do that. Because the council have been a bit strict about land posts. And we can't put things on land posts and stuff anymore. So it's worth remembering then that Paul is uh, speaking to us today from Philippians 2.17. And it's worth remembering that as Paul speaks, he is in jail. He is in jail. He's suffering for his Christian faith, for his ministry, for his service to God. He's in jail, he's in Rome, he's awaiting trial. And we know a little bit about Rome at the time. We know that Rome at that time was under the, the rule of a lot of very, very hostile sort of emperors. We know that Nero was in Rome. Okay? Nero was the guy who was particularly down on Christians, uh, certainly after he caused his fire. We don't quite know the dating. There's debate about the dating as to which imprisonment this is, but, but there you go. He's in jail, he's in Rome, he's awaiting trial, and his life is in question. What's going to happen? The jail wasn't comfy, jail wasn't very pleasant, jail was pretty unpleasant. Uh, it was a hard place to be, it was a hard experience to have, and he's there, waiting to know whether they're going to kill him for following Jesus. And there are always those guys up in Jerusalem, big churches, big opportunities for ministry, proper remuneration for their tasks, meeting the needs of those Jerusalem apostles, their wives, their families. And here's Paul, squeezed. Paul is squeezed. We don't know what ever became of Paul's wife under the pressure of him becoming a Christian and setting up as a Christian preacher. We don't know what happened to her. She disappeared off the scene. We do know that he is a man who knows shipwrecks, and he knows imprisonment, and he knows beatings, even being stoned and left for dead because he loved Jesus and was going to follow him. We know Paul was a man who had been from a wealthy background and he needed to learn to do without as well as to have had. And why was he subject to those trials? And why was he subject to those hardships? And why was he subject to those sufferings? The real question, you can talk to me if you want to. <laughs> because he was following Jesus. He got comfortable as a Pharisee, but for the fact <coughs> that he was living a lie. He was living an empty lie. With a great outward appearance, but a heart in defiance of God. And God spoke to him about it, and God dealt with him about it. And from then on, everything was great, except people kept picking on him. <laughs> and he never had enough of anything. And he was always squeezed for following Jesus. Somebody told me a story two or three weeks ago when he went on something like this. Brother Andrew. You've heard of Brother Andrew? Brother Andrew was a missionary. He says little about his background before that because of the work he was doing. He's given his life to serving and supporting, supporting persecuted Christians all over the world. Firstly in you know, the east of Europe, and then, well, at the moment he's doing a lot in Afghanistan. Here's a guy who goes into sort of uh, religious schools in closed Muslim countries, and he's invited to come and speak to them about what Christianity is about, so they know. Here's a guy who appears to have been baptising them in their tens and their twenties, following such events. given his life to that sort of work. So he's lived out his life not quite knowing when his commitment to Christ is going to cost him his life. He's lived daily amongst people who are regularly called to undergo seven shades of suffering for the sake of Christ and the Gospel. And the word went out that uh, he, was, he was going to pop up at a big Christian conference, so everybody's there. And he's going to be speaking at the evening meeting. So that the evening meeting, the big auditorium, will pack, jam-packed evening full of people. Can you imagine? It would be, wouldn't it? And of course the band comes on, the band does the big old work up, you know, fantastic dynamic worship stuff, and you know, great, like we have here, not like we have here. <laughs> um, great big, you know, fuss is made and whatnot, and he's coming to speak. Do the preach, and there's really quite a buzz in the place. He stands up, and he opens his Bible, this grey-haired little old guy, as he now is. 
And he read from the passage of scripture where te Jesus teaches his followers that those who seek to live a godly life in Christ Jesus are going to be persecuted. And then he closed up his Bible, looked out at the expectant congregation and said, so what is the matter with you people? And quietly left the building. We're starting a series on the problem of pain and suffering and how Christians can meet that challenge if they have a mind to. But as we do so, we're listening to people <coughs> who bank on the fact that following Jesus is going to mean for us what following Jesus meant for Je being Jesus meant for Jesus. Does that make sense? So as we're listening to Paul, he's not speaking to us as a 20th century Western um, you know, Christian in the comfortable surroundings of Vice Alfred Hall, right? He's speaking to us as a guy who knew what it was like. Follow Christ and put his life on the line. See the rugby yesterday? <laughs> there were these Italian guys who were struggling to, to deal with the Welsh forwards onslaught because there was a lot of rain about. You watched it, didn't you? Were you forced to? No, I was watching You always watch it, excellent, well. It was, it just, I expect Andrew was watching it, so I thought he the choice, but great, that's cool. It was wet, wasn't it? It was a rough game. It was a forward dominated game. Everything was in the pack. It was physical, it was violent. And you see these poor, poor Italian guys sort of throwing themselves at the thing, putting their bodies on the line. These guys are prepared to put their body on the line, kicking a bag of wind around the pub. Paul is the sort of guy talking to us today who's ready to put his body on the line and his life on the line. For the sake of Christ, not for the sake of eternity. So he speaks quite directly to us. He's in jail. He's putting his life on the line. He's putting his body on the line at the moment. He's been short of everything until the Philippians have just sent their recent gift. He's squeezed all the time. Squeezed has been the story of his life ever since he met Jesus. How do you feel about that? He's a man who'd known shipwrecks and imprisonment and beatings and stoning. We know he was a man who had needed to learn to deal with these things. Being subject to these things. Why? Why is Paul's ministry so unblessed? Is he in this situation because he's been unfaithful to God? Was it because he's been doing something wrong? See, that's the way our churches think. It's actually because he was doing something right. Was it because he'd lost God's blessing on his ministry? That's the way our churches think. Actually, no, it's not. It's because God's blessing really, really was on his ministry. And the whole Praetorian Guard knows that he's there for Christ. The elite crack troops of the Empire, guarding the Emperor at the heart of the Empire, know why he's there and what he's about. Is it because he's not in the place that God wants him to be, somehow having missed the plan or purpose of God for his life, for his ministry? Quite the reverse. See, there are dangers in coming under pressure as a Christian. Think of it like this. In Judaism, before Jesus, the idea was that anyone who was suffering, as Paul was now suffering, has caused displeasure to God, was under the judgment of God. That's the way they thought. That's the way they saw it. If you're not prospering, you're under God's judgment. Paul's not prospering. Not materially. But spiritually, it's quite different. Paul has come to see that this suffering is not God's condemnation, but God's authentication, his stamp of approval on people actually following Jesus. So we're looking at a series on this. We're looking at a series connected to what we do as Christians, what we go through as Christians, and how we deal with that. Because there's a Jesus. That's what it's about. So how does Paul see his situation then? How does he see this situation in his Roman jail? He says, I'm being pulled out like a drink offering. <coughs> Even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service, coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. The Christian is saying, yeah, here's my worship to God. You see it being difficult for me to do this? You see it being difficult for me to follow Jesus in this way. Here's my worship. Now we all think in terms of worship as if it's singing. Don't we? It is. It is singing. Singing is a very important part. But that's not all the Bible means by worship, is it? 
The Bible sees worship as putting your life on the line, putting your body on the line, not just falling across a ball on a path, but putting your life on the line for, for following Jesus. And that's the idea Paul has got here. He says, this, this experience that I'm having is like offering back to God the life that I have for his service. Christ has died on the cross for me. Christ has come out of the glory of heaven. Christ has laid down his life for me to be right with God, for me to be in the right with him. Here's how I say thank you for that sacrifice. I put my life on the line as far as I can for him. I follow him. Making any sense? Well, you see, the trouble is that, uh, <clears throat> trouble with us as Christians is this, we, we grumble. <laughs> Do you grumble? I'm getting to the age now, okay, I'm getting to the age in this culture, I don't know what it's like in Slovakia, but in this culture, I'm getting to the age where you become a miserable old man. You come across this? <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, it's okay, you can say that to me, it's fine, we're fine, it's okay, no problem. You get to a certain age, well, you get going through life, your temptations change, don't they? You find that? As you go through life, be aware of this, your temptations do to some extent change. And, uh, you get to a certain age, and the temptation to be a bit of a grum, a miserable old guy, is, um, is real. You have to acknowledge this wasn't your problem when you were 22, when you could do everything, and you were invincible, and you could run up walls, and, you know, jump through windows, and stuff like that. Those were the days, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I feel this too. Okay? But now the temptations are different, and the temptation now is, my life will be better than this. <laughs> Grumbling is quite an Old Testament concept, isn't it? Have you come across that? Mm -hmm. yeah, you go through the Old Testament, you find that the Israelites are wandering around in the desert, yeah? And they're grizzling all the time. Poor old Moses. I mean, Moses, what a life. You know, how awful was that? Jonah. Yeah, go on. Jonah. Well, Jonah might Jonah grizzle too, isn't he? Let's face it. You, you can go through there. I mean, I just, I haven't got much beyond numbers or Exodus. You go to Exodus 16. God takes those people out of Egypt where they are slaves. He takes them off into the desert. Which is a bit of a downer. It's warm. Uh, it takes them off into the desert and uh, wanders around. And where are we going to meet? And God comes up with bread from heaven for them, directly from heaven. God will feed them with His own hand, wandering around in a desert. There's your manna, and they grumble because there's no meat. Are you boring? Oh, God's just. Hmm? Let's go back to Egypt. We have leeks and garlic there. You, you go into Numbers 14, the spies go out and look at the promised land and all this great stuff that God's prepared for them. There's always somebody, in that case there was 10 out of the 12, five sixths, came back and they said, uh, Oh, the giants, and oh, it's going to be hard. And, oh, you know. Sounds like a lot of church meetings I've been in. Yeah? <laughs> they grumble. Oh, God, oh. And you know, Joshua and Caleb, Caleb stand up. Yes, I know, Caleb, Caleb, Caleb. Korah's rebellion, number 17. The Israelites grumbled against the Lord. And those Korah, that band, bunch of the Levites. And the ground opens up and swallows them up. That's how seriously God takes grumbling. It's become a very respectable Western evangelical sin to grumble. God takes it seriously. Jesus had to deal with it with the Jewish leaders of his day in John 6, verse 40 following. He said, I'm the bread of life. And the Jews began to grumble about him, the leaders of the Jews, because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not jo jo Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? The bread from heaven, grumbling. The background is obviously the manner in the wilderness, isn't it, in Exodus 16. Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them. And I will raise them up at the last day. It's written in the prophets. And he takes them on a Bible study. In this very chapter, Paul picks up on the problem in the congregation at Corinth, at, at Philippi. Tremendous congregation, planted in the most remarkable of ways, with people from diverse backgrounds, marvellous church. And at the heart of it, two women. Senior women in the congregation, Euodia and Syntyche. And what are they doing? Taking offence. Rumbling and complaining against one another.
Grumbling is really serious. It's something to really watch out for. Because of the lies that it tells about God when his people grumble. It tells the lie about God that he's not kind to his people. It tells the lie about God that he's not good to us and loving and caring towards us. It tells the lie that he's not able to take care of his people. And at my age, I tell you, I have to watch that. Some of you at my age too. <laughs> it's not easy. Look at the emphasis Paul gives in this chapter to not letting our pressures cause grumbling. Therefore, my dear friends, just a few verses before our text. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's what you do. Continue to work out your salvation. Salvation is God's free gift that's been given to you. Now work it out of you into the world in which you live. Let it sort of branch out into the world. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. How do you mean, Paul? What are you talking about? What are you getting at? Do everything without grumbling or arguing. He's what I'm getting at. So that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Guys, there is a cost to consistent Christianity. He means following Jesus. I have two of them sat down for just getting warm. Is that, is that what you yeah. So there's a cost with it. Why? Why is there a cost with following Christ? Why should there be a cost with following Jesus? Surely everything should be fine now. Everything should be easy. We should be living easy lives. We shouldn't be having to pray about radiotherapy and operations and, and stuff like that. There's a reason for a cost to Christianity. Why? Firstly, because we live in a fallen world, which is hostile to God. We live in a fallen world, where things are not as they were designed to be. So bad stuff happens to good people. Actually, it's, it's an authentication of what we believe, not a condemnation of it or denial of it or something. We do live in that sort of world. Bad things happen to good people. It also happens because we're part of a fallen, being restored, but sin-riddled church. There's sin in a church. Of course, there's, why should... Why wouldn't there be sin in a church? There are people in a church. People sin. It's because things in this sort of world and in this sort of church don't always fulfil God's ideal. There's going to be hardship. And it's because there is an evil, agile provocateur, the enemy of souls out there, doing his thing to give grief to the church of God. He goes round, prowling round like a lion, looking for whom he may devour. Defeated at the cross, but still waging war against the people of God. So, how unfair of God to ask us to do that. Is it? Paul's going to face that as he's in his jail cell, isn't he? As it gets hard, he's got to face that. He isn't asking us to do anything he hasn't done himself already for us. He isn't asking us to bear with the cost of following him without having borne such a cost himself to put us right with himself, to give us eternal life. He sent his son into extreme poverty, 2 Corinthians 8 9. Though he was rich, yet he became poor, so that we through his poverty might become rich. He sent his own son to face rejection by his own people. He came to those who were own. His own received him not. And to those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And ultimately he suffered an excruciating death on a Roman cross. God's mission cost who the most? It cost him the most that we might have life in his name. Guys, having said all of that negative stuff, the call of God isn't to suffer. The call of God is not to suffer, but to shine. 
you used to meet people, certainly in my early Christian experience, who seem to think that godliness came with an afflicted and pained expression. Um, people with a particularly, you know, afflict. You're laughing because you've seen this. I can tell. Uh, you come across this as well. Well, yeah, I've certainly come across it. The godly look particularly afflicted. You know? you come across that. Yeah, that's rubbish, isn't it? Can you see from these verses how particularly mistaken this is? He says, do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation, and then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. You're not here to whine, you're here to shine. And this experience that's coming to you, maybe a hard experience, it's not for you to whine, it's, it's so that you can shine as you, as you meet that on the resources that God supplies. As you meet that, with your eyes fixed on the Christ he's been emphasising in the previous verses. Here's the key to it. Key, key issue. As you hold firmly to the word of life. Holding firmly to that word of life. Feeding your soul on that, day by day. Whether you're hearing it or reading it, we're going to take that on board. But, but, whichever it is, here's the key. Feeding yourself on Christ so that you don't whine, but you shine. So this absence of grizzling against the goodness of God is closely connected to holding firmly to the word of life. Of course it is. Because you will not for long continue to follow the Lord if you're continually grumbling against him and persuading yourself of how bad he's being to you. That he's against you. That's how crucial this is. And the truth actually lies otherwise. Paul is convinced that the fruitfulness of the life he's leading, the willingness of God to, to, to take Paul's rigorous experience and make it fruitful in eternity. You can read about that in this passage of scripture. Godly labour is fruitful. You bear fruit. That's the way to a fruitful life. Following Jesus, serving him. Doing something in his name that isn't going to pass away when we become dust and ashes, but is actually going to last forever. That's the good thing about following him. Because his mission, as we follow him in it, has its own consequences. Consequences that last. My life, he says, goes out like a drink offering. I'm glad about it. Because I'm investing my life in God's future. You've only got one life. Is that, is that fair? To do it with. When I was up in London, there were some uh, elderly ladies there in that area who'd say things like, Well, dear, you're a long time dead. Thank you very much. That's a cheerful thought for the day. <laughs> yeah, it's true, isn't it? You've only got one life to invest and do something with. And investing it in Christ, you're investing it in something it's going to last forever. Because he makes sure. And Paul is going through that experience of hardship and difficulty and suffering and the pain that's being brought on him. He says, see it like this. See it as my life being poured out as just a drink offering. Not, not, not the main offering. You, you got this. The drink offering was the one at the end of the service. The, the main offerings of the day at the Jerusalem temple were done on the altar. They were the big deal. They were you know, blood sacrifice and all the rest of it. And the drink offering was just something poured around in the ditch on the ground, around the base of the altar afterwards. Paul says, I'm pouring out my life just, just like a drink offering. It's not the big one. It's just my offering. Just at the end here. See, like that, he says, my chance then to shine, my chance then to do something with my life, is going to last forever under the good hand. Well, the point of this passage about bearing with hardship for us here then is this. Paul is in a situation of some hardship and difficulty. So am I. <laughs> there you go, it's a conclusion. Paul is in a situation of some hardship and difficulty. And those things come to us in this life because of the sort of non ideal world we live in. We can account for why. But once you've accounted for why, that doesn't necessarily help you to deal with it. 
Paul says, the way I get to deal with it is if I, I see it in, this, in these terms. My life is poured out as a drink offering, as worship to God. In doing something that's going to last forever. More than that, you see, he sees that his, his role in all of this is given that affliction, is to shine. And in shining when things are hard, he's giving glory to the God who enables him to do that. In a fallen and broken world. In Paul's case, his troubles arose specifically out of his following of Jesus. We'll look at other things in coming weeks that don't arise quite like that. But in his case, it does. And he's determined to think little of his hardships, because dwelling on them only magnifies them, and to concentrate on the Christ who's captured his vision. For whom he lays down the life that he's got to live. Not called to wine, but shine. And the challenge of following Christ through hardship lies not in experiencing hardship, but in following Christ through hardship and shining through it, as he did, to the glory of God. That's how Christ is faithfully represented in the world. Not by the degree of difficulty that we encounter, but how we shine through it. And the way we do that, says Paul, at the front of this chapter, is to keep considering Christ. The Christ of that hymn, the front, go read that this afternoon. Keep considering him. Keep looking at what he was like. Keep looking at what he was about. And focus on his self-denial on my behalf that I might have life. His sacrifice on behalf of me, not mine on behalf of him. The source of my life. Amen.